number seven, USC. At number 20, Utah, Rice Eccles. This is the game that you had to tell me again last week. It's going on at Rice Eccles because I mistakenly thought it was going on at the Coliseum. How do you see this one playing out? Yeah, th- this fairy tale run of USC is over in Salt Lake City. Sorry, Trojan fans. Um, yeah, I, that, it, I know some of our bosses are Trojan. I, I don't care. It, it, it's going down this weekend. Um, it's like the fa- I've been looking forward to this game all year. Um, Utah's a favorite, and they just lost to UCLA this past weekend. I don't think uh, a Pac-12 school really. I don't think anyone has has won at, at, at Utah since 2018. Here's why I think it's a, a really tough matchup for uh, for for USC guys. They've had luck. It's okay to have luck. Like you make your own luck, right? They're plus 15 in turnover margin. RJ in six games so far this season, they have recovered every single fumble on the field, whether they fumbled the ball or the other team has fumbled the ball. That's nearly impossible to happen. Guess what? All that ends on the road in in Salt Lake City. Nothing well. I watched Oregon last season go into Salt Lake City and get their butts whooped. Nothing good happens in Salt Lake City. They allowed almost 200 yards rushing to Washington State last weekend. Utah will rush for 200 yards in this game. We saw USC's offense start to take a little bit of a dip, guys. Caleb Williams was completing 74% of passes his first three weeks. It's down to 56 now, the last three games against conference opponents. They have not been as crisp on offense. Their offensive line is struggling a little bit to protect him, and they just have not scored as many points. Look, 17 points is Oregon State, 30 last weekend against Wazoo. I kind of think all this, this magic that's happening so far kind of ends. I do worry about Utah scoring points. They, they have had a problem without Brent Keithy in there. Utah's de- excuse me, USC's defensive line is much better than I thought it would be this season. So they do get some pressure. They do harass quarterbacks. By the Utah's just built for this game. They're at home again. They're off an embarrassing loss to UCLA. I think mean, they have everything in 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 the making to to win this game. They're favored by three. Uh, I like Utah a lot. I'm going to push back and say the most embarrassing loss they suffered this year was to Florida and not to an undefeated UCLA. I'm just going mean, to throw that out there. I'm gonna they give were down out. 41 to 24 in the fourth quarter against UCLA. I mean, like, it's a good UCLA's, football team. They're a good football team, but they did things that they, they again, red zone offense is a problem for them. Um, like, they had one on one matchups, Clark Phillips and Jake Bobo. Bobo won those matchups. Like, the things that they're supposed to be good at, they weren't good at in this game. Tackling was bad again. But USC, we're, this is what teams are doing to USC. They're doing what you watch Oklahoma for so many years, right? What do defenses do to Oklahoma? To run the ball, fine. Just run the ball all you want. Just we're not giving up explosive pass plays, right? Like that's what Oregon State's done, Washington State has done. Utah's doing the same thing. Utah's best part of their defense is their secondary. They're going to say, look, man, just run the ball all you want. We don't trust. And Lincoln Riley has mentioned this this year that he is, he sometimes gets away from the run too early. Like, they're going to say, USC, run the ball as many times as you want. We're just not going to allow explosive class plays. I'm going to put on my for real analyst hat here and say some really nice things about USC, Lincoln Riley, Alex Grinch, and what they're able to do and what they're not able to do. Okay. First way I'm going to go about this is, frankly, I know the coaching staff. All right. Um, very familiar with what Lincoln Riley is good at, what he's not good at, what Alex Grinch is good at, what he's not good at, and what they want to do offensively and defensively offensively they want to control the tempo they do want to run the football and maybe he does get away from it a bit early but that's because he's got a Belitnikov award winner on the outside yeah he's got a five-star guy that's in the conversation being a Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback that's one so if I got to get Jordan Adams uh, or Jordan Addison head up against Clark Phillips I'll take that and I'll take what I can get okay number two on that Alex Grinch does not necessarily care to stop the run what he cares about is tackles for loss and turnovers This is a man who once commissioned a master's level paper to find out how many turnovers it would take for the football team to be good. Came up with, if the defense creates 20 takeaways in the season, no matter what the offense does, they're going to win nine games or more. So he's not really looking to do anything other than what you stressed. We're going to want the ball on the floor and we want to go get it. So if Tavion Thomas can hold on to the football, that's awesome for Utah. They can go win the game that way. But if you want to make it about Cam Rising against Caleb Williams, I'll put it to you this way. Lincoln Riley recruited Cam Rising to Oklahoma and had him committed there for a, a good while, which is another way of saying he knows what he's good at and knows what he's not. Tavion Thomas also was recruited to Oklahoma, a guy that they probably know what he's good at and know what he's not. I'm going to say that I'm going to give USC the benefit of the doubt here, number one, because they've shown every game this year they'll win the game. And if we're talking about winning games, that's what they do. Yeah. 
And if you go down to Rice Eccles and you can beat up on a Utah team that, to your words, is coming off of an embarrassing loss, I think that ought to count for something and then some. Like, it, and in a year one? Uh, uh, it, look. Yeah, but we, it, it, it's, yeah, if they win, we'll talk next week about it. But I don't think they win this game. So I'm not sure that's something you have to worry about. Look, um, it, we, we, we've seen – look, we've seen this season – how hard it is for good teams to play on the road, right? I mean, just I, I look, look even out west, right? Look what Washington has done the last two weeks on the road. Just falling straight apart. Utah on the road this season. Florida, UCLA, falling straight apart. UC, uh, USC's one road game this year. They won by three on the road against Corvallis. I'm not counting Stanford. as That was a home game. They have more fans at, at, at that game than, than, uh, than, uh, than Stanford did. It's hard to play on the road, especially when you don't do it very often. Like I think that's a big part here. They they kind of lost control at times against Oregon State with false starts, with delay games. They used all their timeouts early in the first and third quarter. Like I think this is going to be a problem for them going to right cycles. They haven't experienced that all season long. Well, in no time like the present. I'm really fascinated to see who comes out with the win in this game because Utah can obviously play themselves back into the Pac-12 championship game conversation, and yeah. USC is – who many people expect to be the first team since Washington 2017 to make it into the college football playoff. But to do that, going to have to run the table, going to have to win the big, uh, the big, the Pac-12 championship. Next game oh, on the slate. You got ahead of yourself there, didn't you? You got ahead well, of yourself I always get there. Ahead of, well, look, yeah, look, I, 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 you know where I live. I live where number eight Oklahoma State is going <laughs> to travel to Dallas Fort Worth to take on the Texas Christian Horn Frogs. Number 13, Texas Christian Horn Frogs, undefeated. Texas yeah. Christian Horn Frogs against the undefeated Oklahoma State Cowboys. Look, I was doing, was doing the math on this one. Okay. Uh, number one, nobody thought this was going to be a game for Big 12 supremacy in October. Not, not no one. Anybody that says yeah. so is lying to you. Other thing is, we're going to get a mid 2000s Big 12 game, Jeff. <laughs> Look, OSU's averaging 45 points a game, TCU's averaging 46 points a game. Both yeah. teams putting up damn near 500 yards of offense and both have quarterbacks that can cook your brisket. Okay. I'm excited because both those dudes are gunslingers. Sonny Dykes wants every bit of Mike Gundy. Mike Gundy yep. wants any, every bit of Sonny Dykes. What are you most excited about in this game? Who can get more stops on defense, mm. right? Like that, that to me is what matters. And right now, Oklahoma State, I think, has that advantage. You look at what they can do with their defensive line. They're sixth in the country and have a great TCU's offensive line um, is good, but not great. I think that's a good opportunity for Oklahoma State to really hamper this offense by getting after their offensive line. Like that to me is, is the big difference in this game. Oklahoma State defensively is just far better. And um, if you have two good offenses, which you do here, two potent offenses, you have to look at, at those auxiliary factors, right? I mean, points per drive fa favors Oklahoma State. Uh, the, the ability to wreak havoc favors Oklahoma State in this spot. And so that's why I think they ever so slightly can, can, can get this done because they have a slight edge in – those categories on defense that'll translate well to this TCU team. Man, I'm excited. I'm excited because the Oklahoma State's offense Great. looks like the Kansas City Chiefs of old. They got a bunch of short, fast black dudes on the outside, and they got a dude that can spin it to them. <laughs> we got Braytons, we got Braylons, we got Brennans. We are going to absolutely come after. We got Jaden Nixon's returning uh, uh, kickoffs for touchdowns. And then on the other side, we got Joe Gillespie. I'm very familiar with Joe Gillespie, right? Defensive coordinator at my alma mater University, Tulsa, turns out the Bed and Eric Award winner. And my man, Zayvon Collins from Hominy, Oklahoma, playing with the Arizona Cardinals. Look here. I got to know Joe Gillespie the first time. I said, what are you looking for from, you know, outside linebackers in this quality defense that you run? Hey, RJ, I need a couple of guys that can line up at foot nine. I need a couple of guys that can uh, understand the hook and the flat. And I need some guys that are going to get in the backfield and put somebody on the keister, all right? That's what I want. And you can see it on the sideline. He has that defense fired up. They're not as sound as Derek Mason's Oklahoma State defense. But again, you didn't have much at uh, – or you didn't have much. Yeah. He didn't have much to go on at Oklahoma State, but I like to think that Gary Patterson left the cupboard somewhat full for Joe Gillespie to do what he's doing down yeah. there. Very excited to see how this goes. Um, let's get to another Big 12 game. This one I'm kind of – I'm kind of afraid of, but not really. You know, I'm saying that. Number 19, Kansas at Oklahoma – uh, Oklahoma's a nine, eight and a half point favorite going into this into this one. We don't expect Jalen Daniels to play in this game. He's had a separated shoulder uh, in the very close contest against Texas Christian last week. Conflicting reports, him being one of them saying, hey, uh, I, news to me that I'm going to be out for the season. But for this game, we expect to see Jason Bean be the starter. 
And he's done that before. And he acquitted himself well last week. I think 262 through the air, four TDs and a pick in an outstanding game against an outstanding Texas Christian team. And then Oklahoma looking to stave off its first four-game losing streak since 1996. Jeff, I was nine the last time that happened. And I make this point. Yeah. I haven't experienced a losing season since I was 11 years old. And yet this might be the first time I got to look at a program called Oklahoma yeah. that might start the season three and four. What do you think it needs to go on for Kansas to win this game or for Oklahoma to win this game? Well, if you're, I'm looking at some numbers right now. They, the numbers I see project Oklahoma to win by 31 points. That feels like that's a little high. Um, I don't, I mean, I mean, last year's Kansas team. I'm look, I, I think obviously the backup quarterback situation is, is a concern, right? I mean, no matter how many times you've done it before having a backup quarterback, especially when you've done so well with Daniel so far this year, right? They've been the big story, your game day. They're like all these things that kind of have gone in your way and you lose your quarterback. How do you come out the next week on the road? I believe they're on the road, right? Yeah. They're on the road. Um, after the game there, I feel like this is a very, and again, college football, you have to talk about the emotions of the players. This feels like an emotional letdown spot for Kansas, right? Again, game day, you host a game day, you lose that game, the quarterback's out, and now you travel to a wounded Oklahoma team who I'd imagine you think throughout the week, I've been this spot before, you think like, yeah, like, all right, we'll be fine. Oklahoma stinks, like we'll make it work. But Oklahoma, I, I don't think is that bad, RJ. I, I get they've sucked lately. The scores aren't great. But the coaching staff will figure it out. This is my opinion. I think that the panic over Oklahoma is way too premature. Um, and now you're getting a backup Kansas quarterback. I think this is a spot where Oklahoma can sort of get right. Is is Dylan Gabriel playing yet? That's part of it. I mean, it's Tuesday. It's hard to tell. If he plays, I feel better about their offense, of course. I mean, they showed nothing last weekend against Texas. They're holding cards close to the vest on who the starting quarterback is going to be, but it is definitely a different team when Dylan Gabriel is not the guy. Uh, yeah, going out think on... it, it's hard. But this idea that like one or two teams have a backup quarterback they put in and, then, and they're good, like Clemson or Alabama, like that's it. Ohio State maybe, right? Like this idea that because one or two teams, most teams have terrible backup quarterbacks. That's why they're the backup. Like it's it's hard to win with backup quarterbacks at any level. Like this idea that like. Yeah, Oklahoma stunk because their backup quarterback stink. What a surprise. Like, they brought in Gabriel for a reason. They had no one on the roster that could be a starting quarterback for them. Uh, I mean, you got a point, but I'm used to having backup quarterbacks named Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield, you know, the like. But that's another discussion that we can have. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.